thank you very much indeed. Nick. It's great to be here, and I'd like to thank Pearson for producing this excellent set of essays. I'm sorry that uh, my time here is a bit more limited than I'd hoped because since this event was planned we've now got a debate on higher education <laughs> starting in the Commons in uh, just about half an hour. I'll be lucky if the debate was as well attended as this session. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, if only, but nevertheless I do have to go and just finish polish my speech for the, ne for the next event. Uh, but let me just very briefly make a few reflections on arising from this very stimulating set of essays. First of all, as Nikki rightly said, our universities, I think, are becoming increasingly central to our national life. And they have a wide range of roles, obviously intellectual leaders. Uh, and another very interesting feature of our university system, an unusually high proportion of our research conducted on university campuses. And many countries remember uh, Germany is a conspicuous example, where the research institutes are essentially a different structure disconnected from the network of universities. What I notice all the time is research institutes, if they're not already under the auspices of a university, wishing to come under the auspices of a university. Uh, of course, they have many other functions as well. They're very important for the local economy. They're very important for training the next uh, generation. They're very important for uh, the wider economic agenda of the government. And sometimes those purposes which are utilitarian, cause a kind of concern in the academic community that we've lost sight of the original picture of a university as a place for intellectual curiosity and where we can transform, and, uh, uh, transmit a, not just a body of knowledge but a kind of sceptical understanding from one generation to the next. And I really think people just have to hang a little bit more loose about it. We have to be a bit more relaxed. The fact is that, of course, Fundamental intellectual curiosity is a key feature of academic life, but all these other roles exist as well, and I think universities should welcome the fact that they have these multiple missions, and they should regard them as uh, all as potentially very rewarding and worthwhile. Some of these anxieties about the role of university, perhaps because after all we are talking about an academic institution, have ended up as essentially arguments about words. And there are two arguments about words which I find particularly tiresome. So let me just get it out of my system. One argument about words is that such and such an ex-polytechnic isn't really a university. The people applying to go to university this year, the people who will be going, starting at university in uh, the next few weeks, weren't born when polytechnics became universities. And we just have to be grown up about the fact that in Britain now, as in most other advanced countries, university is a broad, generic term. I very much doubt if in San Jose, if, if there is a California State University in San Jose, I very much doubt people regularly write into local paper saying this isn't really a university, it's some other institution. We should just be relaxed about that university is a broad term embracing a range of roles and we should be completely uh, welcome to that. And there's a second almost sort of symmetrical argument, which has emerged in the last year or two. There is something called the public university, and we're supposed to value the public university with an implicit contrast with all these other nasty things, which is not a public university. Carl. <laughs> <laughs> now, I just wonder what this public university is. Uh, the one thing, incidentally, that the advocates of the public university don't seem at all keen on is that universities should join the public sector. Now, that would be fun. Then they're borrowing to account towards the public sector borrowing requirement, and they'd all be directly controlled in the way they are in France. So, first of all, we understand this public university isn't actually be part of the public sector, which I very much welcome. If it means that in that list of roles of universities, a very incomplete list I gave at the beginning, <coughs> many of them have a public value and a public function, absolutely correct. I completely recognise that. They are very important national institutions with a whole host of public roles. If they mean that the financing of the university should be partly the responsibility of the exchequer, not solely, but that the exchequer should play an important role in financing universities, again, I completely accept that. And contrary to the caricatures, when you look at the way in which universities are funded, if you put together the money that rightly goes to students for their own financial support and maintenance, 
the very significant continuing support for teaching universities, both through the more expensive courses, but also through the so-called ramp charge, the element of the student fee loan that we rightly don't collect when graduates are uh, in less well-paid occupations. That's even before you get into the research funding. There is quite rightly a continuing flow of a significant sum of public money to our university. And if you mean by the public university that there are some other universities that should not be allowed to have the title university, and this is where my eye was called, uh, caught by Carl, my view is that the story of higher education in England is of successive waves of new entrants coming in to enrich the system. I rather buy the kind of a Whig history, a progressive history of higher education. I do see it as successive waves of new creations, and each new creation treated with enormous scepticism and disdain by the incumbents. When UCL was created as a secular alternative to the Anglican monopoly through Oxford and Cambridge, Coleridge, no less, denounced it as a mere lecture bazaar in which people would be paying to go to individual lectures, and it was very important that it should face a competition from kings created by the Tory interest as a competition. If you then look at the way in which the great civic universities, when Birmingham was created, the mockery of Birmingham, when Joseph Chamberlain wanted Birmingham to serve the civic industrial purposes of Birmingham, the mockery of some of those other great civic institutions, sometimes with an explicit purpose of serving the civic economy of our leading cities, they were all criticised. I think, again, we should welcome the fact that those universities come with a range of legal uh, uh, identities, they specialise in different things, and for a university to focus on wishing to provide a high quality education to train people for uh, particular uh, working life, provided regardless of whether they're a profit-making institution or not, the crucial thing is that they have to meet the standards which constitute higher education. That's what we should care about. And I think if we break free from the, these concerns about trying to categorise, uh, as I said, universities as against polytechnics or public as against private, and take a rather more relaxed and open and welcoming view, we will all be able to celebrate a healthy, lively and diverse sector. And that's what I believe in. Thank you very much indeed.